Uh, good evening and welcome to the Planning Commission of the City of Moreno Valley. I now call this meeting to order on April 25, 2019 at 7.03 p.m. May we have a roll call, please? Commissioner Brugaris. Here. Commissioner Steven. Present. Commissioner Harris. Here. Commissioner Dijonet. Here. Commissioner Korzik. Present. Vice Chairperson Baker. Here. Chairperson Sims. Here. Okay, uh, the Pledge of Allegiance will be led by Commissioner Dijonet. Please rise, face flat. Okay, we're going to move into uh, the approval of the agenda. Uh, do I have a, a motion for the agenda? I'll move to approve the agenda as submitted. Second. I'll second. All right, we have a motion made by Commissioner Baker and a second by Commissioner Korzak. Vote. All right, we did it, it's approved. <coughs> it's my first time as chair, so haven't seen this part of the, the uh, deal. All right, okay, we're on to uh, public comments procedure. <coughs> so any person wishing to address the commission on any matter, either under the public comments section of the agenda or scheduled items or public hearings, <coughs> uh, must fill out a request to speak form available at the door. The completed form must be submitted to the secretary prior to the agenda item being called by the chairperson. In speaking to the commission, member of the public may be limited to three minutes per person, except for the applicant for entitlement. The commission may establish an overall time limit for comments on a particular agenda item. Members of the public must direct their questions to the chairperson of the commission and not to other members of the commission, the applicant, the staff, or the audience. The next item is public comments on any item not on the agenda. Are there any uh, speakers? No, sir. All right. The next item on the agenda is the approval of the consent cal uh, calendar. So do we have any speaker requests? No, sir. Okay. okay. Um, there is one item on the consent item, which is the minutes from the April 11, 2019 regular meeting. So do we have a pleasure of our commission? I make a motion to approve the minutes as submitted. I'll second. All right, we have a motion by Commissioner Baker and a seconded by Commissioner Dijonet. Uh, let's have a vote. We had a one abs uh, six yes, one abstention. Oh, yeah, you know what? I forgot I wasn't here, so uh, I did. I did. <laughs> that was okay. <laughs> All right, I guess Good I job. still was on vacation in my mind right there. Sorry, guys. Okay, the next uh, item on the agenda is a public hearing item. Item one is a request for a conditional use permit. PEN 18-0195 for a commercial cannabis micro business. The applicant is Christopher Henry and Michael Lee. Can we have staff report? Mr. Chair, the first item will be presented by staff planner Jeff Swack. Chairman Sims, members of the Planning Commission, good evening. Uh, Movell Marijuana is requesting a, approval of a conditional use permit for their micro business to be located at 24889 Elder Avenue. Um, units one through three. A cannabis, their micro business will be um, 
will include a dispensary, uh, the, the following three uses, a dispensary, manufacturing, as well as distribution of items to other commercial businesses, to commercial um, dispensaries. The zoning for the site is community commercial, which is appropriate for a micro business. The nearest residential is at least uh, 350 feet to the west and northwest of this site. The City Council approved um, an ordinance and the municipal code defines a micro business to have a minimum of four types uh, or four components. I'm sorry, uh, a minimum of at least three types of components, manufacturing, cultivation, distribution, and a dispensary. Um, the City Council also is authorizing a maximum of three micro businesses in the city, and this is your first application that you have in front of you tonight. So as mentioned, this, this uh, micro business is looking at having a dispensary, which you've seen in the past, that is the retail use, uh, retail sales of cannabis products. Uh, manufacturing, which is taking cannabis and uh, breaking it down, putting it into packages, labeling it, putting it into boxes for distribution, um, or taking items um, that would be used for cannabis, such as uh, the vapor pens, um, or taking the product and creating cannabis cigarettes, and then packaging those for distribution. Now, it's important to note that the distribution is not to the public. You can't deliver to public. It's not allowed in Moreno Valley. The distribution would be to other cannabis um, dispensaries. Hours of operation for this, built, for this business um, complies with state law between the hours of 6 a.m. and 10 p.m., seven days a week. So the building itself is 30,000 square feet. The um, applicant will be taking the easterly portion of the building. It is approximately 12,164 square feet, and it is a two-story space, as you see from the images in your staff report. The location on Elder Avenue, it is on, the building is on one parcel. There is a tenant on the west, uh, westerly portion of the building. It is West Coast Spas Retail Sales. The easterly portion will be for um, Oval Marijuana. Um, the surrounding businesses, to the west you have a Best Western uh, Motel. On the south you have State Route 60. It's the freeway on-ramp. Uh, to the north, on the north side of Elder, there is a vacant lot, then there is a water treatment facility, and a total of five of uh, fast food restaurants on Elder, west of Paris Boulevard. The site itself has 135 parking spaces. What's required by code for this micro business would be only 50 parking spaces, so there's adequate parking for the new tenant as well as the existing tenant. The business, as I mentioned, it's in a two-story space. Uh, the ground level will be where the dispensary is located, where the manufacturing will take place, and where the distribution will take place. The um, public spaces only deal with the dispensary. The rest of the spaces for the manufacturing and distribution are uh, only for employees, so the only access, the only way to get into those spaces is through controlled um, doors, so they'll have um, locks on them and you would need a key card or a key fob to get from the public space into the manufacturing or the distribution areas. So on the first level, as I mentioned, you have the dispensary, you have the manufacturing, um, offices uh, totaling 9,000, almost 9,800 square feet on the first level. The second level is a little over 2,300 square feet in area. And this is where you'll have, if you looked at the staff report there in the floor plans, it identifies vendor display areas. And what that means is there'll be various booths. So vendors that have different products can um, provide information and education to the customers on different cannabis products or the use of cannabis. And those vendor booths will rotate. So the challenge of having a two, uh, a a space that's on two floors is to make sure that it's, it's secure, to make sure that you will have, in this case, the applicant's proposing um, three armed guards. One will be 
patrolling the second level. One will be stationed at the front door to control the ingress and egress, and the other one, I imagine, would um, rove around the space internally and outside of the building. Um, I had prepared in the PowerPoint presentation some images, but they were also included in the staff report of what the building looks like on the exterior. Um, the applicant is proposing to repaint the building to replace the glass uh, for the parking lot. They will be re-slurry sealing the parking lot because if you've driven through on the property, it's in pretty bad shape. So by slurry sealing and re-striping the parking lot, it will be um, much more visible as where, as where you can park. They will also be, for the landscaped areas that are dead, uh, replacing the landscaping. And in that this, pro this property fronts the freeway, the southerly border has quite a bit of landscaping that's very dense. And in the conditions of approval, um, it's requiring that because that dense landscaping could be a place that people could hide, um, they want to thin out the landscaping. There's actually a condition uh, requiring that the landscape plans be provided to staff for review and approval, but that the landscaping on the south side would be thinned out a bit so that it doesn't create a security problem. Speaking of security, um, the loading areas and the secured parking are actually on the north side of the building. The applicant will have a gated area. Uh, this building does apply itself well, I believe, for um, secured deliveries, secured pickup areas. There will be a gate that will, when the trucks move in, it can close. There will be cameras and a security guard so that if product is leaving, um, product's coming in, or cash is leaving, it's very, uh, it should be very secure. Um, the security plan was submitted to staff for review. Um, it has information that identify that there will be security guards during the hours of operation, as I mentioned that earlier in the staff report. There will be no less than 100 cameras um, inside the building and on the exterior of the space to, uh, so that the guards can monitor activities around the building. Um, as I mentioned, controlled access throughout and the two secured parking spaces will be on the north side of the building in a gated parking area. Odor control as you add uses can be more important than just a dispensary. The applicants will be using specialty carbon filters that will um, filter out the odors as well as particulate matter before the air, air inside the building is released to the exterior so you don't have a strong odor outside of the building. That is what the code requires. The way that the city can monitor that and control it is that is actually information that will be submitted to the building department as part of the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning or HVAC plans that the building division will approve. So the city has complete control over the odor control by um, the tenant improvement plans that are submitted to the city for review. Um, we, uh, in closing, we have received one email uh, only that I'm aware of. This was received from uh, Mr. Tom Jarrell Sr. And his question is that, or his comment is, since the proximity of this microbusiness is fairly close to the Best Western Motel to the west, that, and because there are times when uh, ch children's or youth sport events will be staying, youth will be staying at the hotel, make sure that there is adequate signing that states you have to be 21 years of age or older to enter the premises. Um, and those are conditions that the applicant must follow. Only you have to be 21 years of age to get in, um, and signage is required as well. So with that, I'll close my staff presentation. Um, be happy to answer questions, and the applicants are present as well. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for the uh, staff report. Are there any commissioners uh, with questions for staff? I have questions. On those second floor vendors, can you give me an example of what type of display it, it would be and are they paying to display that uh, a fee to the applicant? Um, I'm not understanding the vendors. Um, I'm, I'm not sure about the second part of your question, whether or not they actually pay to rent space. Maybe th perhaps the applicant can address that for you. Um, but as it was explained to me, they would have uh, uh, individuals there representing different cannabis products that could be, th that either are for sale in the dispensary or could be for sale. And then if people have questions on how to use different 
uh, whether it be um, a can of a cigarette, an oil, or something, how, how they would actually use that. So it would be educational as well. And my understanding from the applicant is the displays would change with time, but perhaps the applicant could shed additional information for you on your question. Sure. Um, I'm not that familiar with the cannabis products, so I was just curious. Yes. Um, and there will be no money or exchange taking place on that level. It's just purely information, my no sales. My understanding is it's purely informational, educational and informational only. Thank you. Question. Um, I had an issue with the name itself because I was, it was kind of like, well, we can't tell them what to name their business. Um, the way I had read everything, it said that there was not supposed to be any evidence of uh, commercial cannabis dispensing, but the name says it all. M Mobal Marijuana, that's basically what they're going to be selling. And it just says the identification signage shall be limited to identification only and shall not contain any information that identifies, advertises, or lists the services or products offered. To me, they don't need anything else but the name. So I don't know. I'm just, it's like a gray area for me, and I just had a problem with it because of what I was reading here. I know 4, 17, 18, and that's where I got this from. When did that change? Uh, so in the ordinance, there are regulations, as you've read, that regulate the number of signage and the type of information on the sign, limiting it to the name of the business. Right. Um, perhaps the city attorney could address the issue of First Amendment freedom of speech, but they, uh, a business can place their name on there, uh, on their single sign. Um, but as far as the name, I, I'm not sure. Right. Um, I just had a problem with the fact that it does state what will be sold, and the way I understood it, they weren't supposed <coughs> to actually... I don't know. I've seen a lot of shops, and I've seen names, and none of them really come right out and say... Correct, and, and the language as you've referred to states that um, the signage shall be limited to the identification of the licensee's business name and shall contain no advertising of symbols, language, music, gestures, cartoon characters, or other content elements known to appeal primarily to persons below the legal age of consumption, wow. uh, the legal consumption age. So. I mean, it's just blatantly out there, you know what I mean? It's like. A horse farm. What's on the farm? Horses. <laughs> I mean, I have a problem with it. I'm not going to tell anybody what to do, like I said, but if they would consider maybe tweaking the name a little, I don't know if they can, if there could be um, some step, you know, some sort of uh, amendment to it, because I know we're going to have a lot of them coming down, and if we set precedent here. And I believe our city attorney has a no, I was going to jump in, but I think you described it okay. fairly accurately. Our code does allow them to, does not restrict <laughs> the, the business name, but it does say that you can't have any other signage other than the business name. Uh, if I may, to address your, I, I, um, I'm Christopher Henry, by the way. To yeah, the, uh, you'll, you'll have your, you'll have your. Uh, yeah, we want to make sure we keep the testimony in the right order. So yeah, just hold on to it. We'll, we'll, we'll definitely get you up. I, I also had a question of staff, similar on the signage, but not exactly the same as is, but typically on these other, these other uh, and we've had several of these uh, type businesses come through for CUPs and, and on, I, I, maybe I missed it, but on none of the exhibits, it, it does not show where signage would be located and kind of typ typically, oh, this, is it on? Oh, I, di I didn't get that, I guess. Uh, okay. so well, so never mind. If it's already there, then... <laughs> to your point, Chairman, um, there the signage uh, review and approval uh, review and approval is conducted by city staff, and typically that's done if the conditional use permit is approved by the planning commission. So the city will the staff will be requiring plans to be submitted, which identify exactly where the signage will be going and what it looks like, how large it is. I Any other uh, <laughs> commissioner questions of staff? Well. I just, you know, I have, uh, like I said, I have a lot of kids and grandkids, and and I just know that everybody that <coughs> does use the product is going to know without really having the name blatantly out there. They're going to know where these shops are, without a doubt. And um, because I've talked to quite a few people that do use, and they told me that. 
And um, so basically, I don't know if you've got a shop that just says that. I don't know. It just maybe as a mother and grandmother, it kind of bothersome to me. And that's, that's not part of what we need to do here, but I'm just, as a resident and citizen, I'm just throwing it out there. Staff, or Commissioner, questions? Yes, I was looking at condition of approval number 21. Uh, no person shall smoke, ingest, or otherwise consume cannabis in any form on or within 20 feet of the dispensary site, uh, Municipal Code 9.09, to blah, blah, blah. Uh, my question is, is because within the conditions of approval, um, we do include parking lots. Does that 20 feet, is that from the front door, or does that also include the parking lot? Uh, my belief is that it's from the business site itself, from the building, um, in that it's difficult to restrict what what could be done in a in a parking lot, especially if it's you know fifty feet, a hundred feet away? The intent is that people typically would come to this facility, purchase the um, the items, and then get in their car and and uh, go to either the residence or somewhere else. Not not take the product close to the facility itself. But my understanding is twelve feet of the building, the dispensary site. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, 20 feet. Yeah, that's pretty close. That's probably the distance between me and you, maybe even less. <laughs> so I wonder then, is there any other municipal code that pro prohibits someone from ingesting uh, marijuana just out in the, in the public, uh, the parking lot areas, just right there in the sidewalk, walking from that place to McDonald's or Taco Bell or to the hotel or... In addition to city law, there there would be state laws, which I don't have with me, um, that would regulate who and uh, who can ingest and where you can ingest um, uh, cannabis products. Um, the city's municipal code deals specifically with, in this case, land use, but, but uh, I would imagine the state law, just as as it affects where you can and can't smoke, uh, where you can and can't drink. Um, that there would be similar requirements to your point on where you can and can't ingest uh, a cannabis product. And just the, and, uh, as a concern, I'd say maybe as a city we might want to extend that to 100 feet, maybe 200 feet or yards. Uh, it's a little close. 20 feet is not very far. Maybe from me into the lab or you, it's, it's pretty close. Uh, the other question I had was... Um, uh, you mentioned three security guards. Um, and would that door security guard, because uh, it says here, again, back to the uh, uh, condition 21, would he would move people away um, from ingesting in front of the building? I, I, I guess that's something for the applicant. Um, since we have three security guards, one on top, one inside, one outside, would that person outside be responsible for um, moving people along, that sort of thing. So maybe the applicant can address that. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, going back to the name, um, you know, it, it talked a lot about things that would appeal to kids, cartoons and such things like that. But I would uh, think that the, even the word marijuana would uh, appeal to 15, 16, 17 year old uh, and their kids. Um, so I'm just, you know, that's, that's one question I would have. That it wouldn't be a violation oh. of the spirit of the law. The spirit of the I, I don't think that that violates the intent of what the, the, um, the Moreno Valley Municipal Code language is regarding signage content. Um, but also remember to your point, which is a very good one, that the, um, it is up to the cannabis operator in that it's a conditional use permit uh, to comply with all of the conditions of approval. And if anyone is underage and goes into the business um, and they're allowing that, that is a huge problem. Um, and so it is to the benefit of the applicant to comply with all conditions of approval, which include regulating the age groups that try to come in and making sure that they show identification, they prove their age, so that 
if the name does attract someone that's 18 years of age, for example, or 20, 20 years of age, they actually cannot come in because they're not 21 or over. Well, I'm, I'm kind of understanding what uh, what they're both saying, and here we are in a new area as the Planning Commission, the City Council in Moreno Valley, uh, bringing in all the dispensaries. And I think what we're, we're I may be trying to say is, before we, um, and I don't know how easy it is to change municipal codes, but before we start getting signage and let's get high, let's smoke it up, let's tear it down, let's do all that stuff, we better set a precedence yeah. before that kind of stuff comes in. <laughs> you know, because of course, we're going to have a pretty saturated town and they're, and they're going to be competing. You know, so I want my place to look the best and I want it to attract the most cups. So I'm going to have a scientist that's going to say, hey, let's get it on. <laughs> you know, and we, we kind of want to stop that before it gets started. Any, any other uh, commissioner questions? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, with the 20 feet, I had a problem at one time. But Chapter 5 in the city ordinance tells every dispensary, every dispensary that already got approved and those that are coming in the future, the license shall prohibit lowering by individual outside the license permit premises or anywhere on the property. So. The security guard has an obligation to remove anybody that's around the dispensary, especially young people. So that's an obligation that the applicant will have if he gets approved. So that's what gives me comfort from the 20 feet. The 20 feet to me means cigarettes as they came out in the past with the federal law. That was the 20 feet of smoking, okay? but. Looking at this, with the last five applicants, is consistent. It all means the same, that no one can hang out on the property. They all got to leave. There's no hanging out. That's what makes me have confidence on this part here about lottery. Now, I want to talk about Michael Business, because I couldn't understand what it meant when I got the staff report. So I had to go back to October 24th, 2017, when it first started, okay? That's when it first started. Those were the rules that um, the staff gave the council members. Then in, in October 2016, 2018, a lot of it was revised, and then we had the rules. In December of 2018, these are the rules, the final rules of what dispensary means. Now, you educated me because I didn't know that you had to have three or more. What I learned by reading the report or the, or the chapters that the one thing they cannot have is testing at all. That I learned. Now, my question is, this individual is going to have three separate components in one. Dispensary, distro, and manufacturing. Are they considered one of each that eliminates one from the 23, one from the five, and one from the three? Or is the micro business one whole piece on its own and doesn't eliminate anything else from the others? And Chair, if I may address that question, that's a very good question. It is actually the City Council authorized a total of um, three micro businesses, so the entirety of this business. There could be three micro businesses in the city. So you wouldn't count a dispensary as one, the manufacturing as one, and distribution as one, to your point. It's actually one business that meets the code definition of a micro business that has at least three of those components. So in other words, with the three, we're going to have an additional three more dispensaries, three more distros, and three manufacturing, besides the 23 that we already got approved. The applicants can choose for the other two micro businesses what combination they want. Perhaps 
they would choose not to have a dispensary but have cultivation. Um, so it's really up to the applicant to decide of those four components which three or they could have all four. Um, okay. The code would allow that as well. But it's up to them to decide, uh, but no, th no fewer than three of those uh, four components can they so have. So that's a separate unit on, on its own. So that doesn't deduct from the 23 or from the other right. ones at all. That, that, that goes to the total okay. number that are allowed in the city, and that number is 43. Right. Okay. So in other words, we allow 23 dispensary. So by having the micro, it's not going to give me 22, drop down to 22. Correct. Right. Okay. I just want to get that clear. Okay. Because we're adding. All right. No problem. Uh, okay. Um, the second floor. Because by accident, I thought the dispensary was going to be on top, and then, but we got that clear because I finally looked at it. It's on its own, and uh, I heard one of the uh, commissioners mention um, that we're going to allow um, customers to go upstairs and look at this place on, on product. So there will be no kind of exchange of um, of um, um, cannabis, there's, there's going to be no giving of packages, try this, take this home, whatever. It's going to be none of that upstairs. And so, Chairman, if I may, um, I, would rec I would suggest at the appropriate time when questions are finished of staff to have the applicant okay. come up and ask. Uh, I have a basic understanding based on what the applicant shared with me on the ver various vending booths throughout, throughout the business, um, and I want to make sure that you get the information directly from the applicant so you understand what, they, what they're proposing, okay. if that's acceptable. Um, one more on the control, order control plans. Oh, plan, yes. In, in, in this case that we didn't do two weeks ago, we mentioned an important word to me, personally speaking, and that's um, carbon filters. Uh, are, are those the best that this applicant is going to put in? Is that the something the best to stop the odor that each other dispensary are going to use? Carbon? I've read through four um, odor control plans uh, that have been submitted. Um, I've seen two, comp two different types of filters, carbon, and the other is more like a, a gel filter. I, I'm not an expert to state which is better. But ultimately, if, there, if you pass by this micro-business or we receive complaints that people are smelling cannabis from the outside or, or have a strange odor, um, the applicant is conditioned to make sure that there is no scent, uh, no particulate matter outside of the business. So if whatever filter they're using is the best but the system isn't working, the air exchange rate is not working, the applicant is required and conditioned to make sure that they address that problem. But, but to answer your question, I've seen two different types. I, I, I'm not sure which is better, but if the carbon doesn't successfully <coughs> eliminate the odor, then they're going to have to address that. Yeah, I got two more questions. Thank you, sir. On page uh, 24, number 32, waste. It talks about waste and storage and disposal <coughs> of marijuana cabinets products. How is waste being disposed of? Do we have a red bag that somebody goes and picks up in a van and takes it with them? My, my understanding and the conversation that I had with the applicant is they will, um, the, the waste that they're referring to is, would be a cannabis product that's expired. Um, you can't just throw it in the trash and put it in the dumpster, as you well know. So the, the local um, waste company uh, has to be contacted. There are regulations for how you can dispose of the products, what you need to do so that people don't jump in the dumpster and pull it out and try to use it after it's expired, but what you do to change it so that it can't be used. And then uh, so the waste companies have a schedule of coming out Picking it up, I'm sure the applicant can describe the specifics, but my understanding is it's a separate type of waste okay. that's disposed of. 
um, and packaged and then collected independently of the regular trash from the business. Okay, that's good to know. Thank you so much. You're welcome. My last one that's important. I know the, the law says that you have to be 21 and over. And I had a conversation with someone. If they have a medical marijuana certificate and they're 18, are they allowed to go inside the shop, inside the dispensary and buy if they have a card and they're 18? My belief is no, <clears throat> because the city's ordinance states you must be 21 years of age or older to go into, in this case, this micro business, to go to the dispensary and buy product. Great. Thank you so much for the answers. Welcome. So, <coughs> Commissioner Vergaris brought up this, this whole thing about the uh, micro business and the tally on the number of dispensaries uh, the ordinance approved. So, but we just, it seems to me just a couple we or a couple meetings ago, or maybe it was the last meeting I was here. I was absent the last one, but th th we approved, <coughs> I think, a distribution and a dispensary, but they were two separate CUPs. Is that is, am I recalling that correctly? I believe you are. Um, in the ordinance, in the ordinance itself, it identifies categories of uses related to um, commercial cannabis businesses. And those can categories are, and this is different from the micro business, so I'll just read those uh, briefly to you. A dispensary, a testing facility, cultivation, manufacturing, distribution, and a micro business. And the city council established a maximum number for each of those categories. So for the micro business itself, the council is allowing a total of three to open up or to be considered by the planning commission by a CUP. So, so where I was going with my question was, is not the number of, of the businesses that the council has approved by ordinance or municipal <laughs> code or however they did it. <coughs> but so, so when the other applicant came in, it was, it was the same applicant, but it was two separate businesses. And within the, the structure itself, there was, you know, uh, lockout, tag out basically between if, uh, an employee going from distribution into dispensary and so they were they'd have uh, card fobs or whatever they are to allow access between so if I un am understanding right the, mo the micro business is and there's only three allowed and this is if this gets approved now there to be two left allowed for the city but the but the applicant the, the people that choose to go the route of the micro business have a smorgasbord of, of any of the th any of the types to put into the one CUP, or and I, maybe not any, but they can pick three of the Four. approved cannabis businesses to right. consolidate it <clears throat> into one CUP. So they can choose three of those four categories or have all four. Okay. So in this case, in addition to uh, what the applicant is proposing, they could have um, chose, if they had a space large enough, to do cultivation as well. Yep, and they're in, in because of this uniqueness of this CUP being a micro business, they don't have to have the internal, unless for internal operation, but from a municipal code, they don't have to have- Demising uh, walls and- Yeah, d correct. divisions in the building to, to uh, inhibit people from going from one part of the business to the other. Right. So in this case, it's one single CUP for the micro business as compared to what you um, considered previously, which were two separate right. CUPs, but adjacent uh, to each other in a building with a demising or a separating wall between the two. Right. Uh, in this case, they're, it's a micro business, so they're having three uses in there, and there, there is no requirement okay. for a demising wall. It's one conditional use permit. Okay, thank you. Is there any other staff questions from the commissioners? Um, I had a question. Um, they were saying they're gonna go upstairs, I guess, and I guess they're gonna educate them on the product. Is that what it was? So this this leasable area has two two floors. The second floor is a little over two thousand square feet, and there would be vendors um, set up in a variety of booths to educate and inform the public. Okay. So that's a public space. I, is there elevators in that building? I don't believe so. Okay. How are the disabled um, going to get up there? Because I, believe me, there's going to be a lot of people that are disabled they, or ill and want. That's an excellent point. Um, there are vendor um, spaces on the first floor as well, and the building must comply with the ADA requirements, um, which are federal requirements. Just, that was my question, is how the people, 
with disability is going to get up there. We will have to complete, comply with all the current ADA standards for it. Okay. We have all of our questions as the staff. All right. All right. We got it. Okay. So it's time for the applicant to come up if they uh, so choose. Watch out because there's been 50 questions so far. Good evening. Uh, my name is Christopher Henry, um, the applicant. Um, and to address some of the questions, let's start with um, yours. Um, the signage, as far as Mobile Marijuana is the entity um, that we applied under, the actual name will be filing for DBA and doing business as Empire. Um, that's our brand, um, which we're rolling out throughout Southern California um, as a whole, and that's going to actually be what the signage depicts and um, what we present to the public, what the, what the public would know us as. Um, so Mobile Marijuana, you won't see it anywhere except unless it's in internal documents, IRS documents, things of that sort, um, corporate files. Um, to, to jump straight into the ADA um, issue, what we've done with the second floor is, uh, for educational purposes, what we're doing is we have dispensaries tend to have vendors that want to educate the public to be able to, to, to boost their sales, right? Um, the way that they do this is they educate them. So through the education process, they bring in flyers, pamphlets, um, displays um, have informationals and things of that sort so as well as the second floor we have a, a section carved out on the first floor um, to the right of the building the north side of the building when you first enter it would be to the right um, where we're going to duplicate exactly what's on the second floor that way we meet the the correct ada standards uh, we're fully aware of them and we'll we'll do everything to comply um, the educational part we're partnering with other um, other businesses in the city like LA Fitness and 24 Hour Fitness. And what they're gonna do is they're gonna come in and they're gonna educate the public as well on proper usage of CBD products because that's, it kind of falls under the, the umbrella, although CBD is now legal under on a federal level, um, it's still sold through the dispensaries as well. Um, so they're gonna be doing a portion on that. Um, we have commitments with them to come in and do yoga sessions and things of that sort to show the proper administration of those um, to help with uh, different types of athletes and things of that sort. Um, Raphael's question, wow, what was your question again that you had? <laughs> Jump in anywhere. Okay. Correct. Correct. No, by state regulations, we're not allowed to give out free samples. If a free sample is given, we have to send them downstairs and it would be done as a purchase. Um, it would have to would be required to pay the tax in order. They would have to pay the tax on us. So there's no free samples anymore, as you would see in some of the older um, it, it, original um, dispensaries that, that came about prior to Prop 64. I have a question. They were talking about the disposal, I guess, of I didn't know if they have I didn't know marijuana had a shelf life, I guess yes. it does. Um, how do you dispose of it? Okay, so to comply with the not only the city regulations but the state regulations, the disposal has to happen in a marked bag. Um, so the product, most of the product that will be disposed of will be product that sits on the shelf for display in, in the sealed containers. That'll be in the pamphlet they're going to be handing out to you. Um, that, as it ages and we dispose of it, has to be mixed up to 50% minimum with another m type of material. So the state recommends either mixing it with um, grounded cardboard, uh, which is the easiest, or grounded uh, soil or some sort of other material so that it's rendered unusable uh, by anybody that may pull out of a trash can. Once that is mixed um, and put into those sealed bags, then um, to comply with state law, we have to call out waste management specific for, for cannabis waste pickup. Um, they'll issue us a way ticket, although that way ticket goes into our, our logs and our, our, um, our, our 
kind of our logs, I guess you would say. And from there, then that, that has to be reported and audited uh, with the state as well with, with the city. So the waste won't be, so in other words, you won't have a bag that's cannabis waste to drop into and it's dropped in a dumpster um, in the parking lot. Um, it has to be stored inside until your scheduled pickup or until you schedule a pickup from waste management. And then a way ticket for that particular waste has to be issued and documented. Okay, now that you gave us this pamphlet, I have another question. Sure. <laughs> um, how much can somebody purchase and leave with? Because I notice it's like $11 a gram for this and then $200 an ounce. I mean, how much can a person uh, Okay, so if, if I'm not mistaken, and don't quote me on it, I believe it's up to two ounces is what the state law currently allows uh, one individual to leave with at one given time. They won't get arrested? No? It's okay for them to take it? Okay. Yeah, it has to be within state guidelines. <laughs> <laughs> And to address your question about the 20 feet, um, our, our security guards will be patrolling. Um, the, one of the, the, the primary responsibilities of the out security guard that's positioned outside will be to monitor the parking lot to ensure that there is no loitering, um, that there is no consumption on site going on in vehicles and things of that sort. Um, the last thing we want is somebody hanging out outside, counting people, scoping the building and things of that sort. So our, um, one of the requirements of the security company would be to ensure that the public is leaving the premise immediately upon exiting the building. That's good. In conclusion, I want to thank you for um, letting us know that that's not going to be the name. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I no, we wouldn't do that. <laughs> I hope everybody else out there really follows suit because right. that was a, a huge concern of mine. Right. No, I, I, I can understand that. Are there any other questions? Uh, yes. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you, you can elaborate a little more on rotating vendor and how um, yes. I, I'm, I'm concerned about the, uh, what an employer, employee has to go through to work at you know, a cannabis-related uh, shop, right. the background check, you know, all the stuff, and how can we just bring in somebody from 24-hour fitness and you know, have them in there? Right, so the vetting process is anybody that's in the building that's working as a contractor or staff will have to undergo um, um, background checks and live scans to comply with the state. Um, we're, we're fully aware of that. So whoever LA Fitness is going to give us as their liaison to be doing those services um, to the public will be required the same constraints. Uh, they'll have to be cleared, and we have to keep that on file. Um, the rotation of the vendors um, will vary from day to day or week by week. Um, normally, a vendor, if they, if they want us to carry their products, they want to also come in and do a, um, you know, a presentation to the public on exactly what it is that they're offering. So those will be scheduled far in advance. The vendors uh, have, the same, have to comply with the same type of requirements. We do any of their sales staff or personnel that's out promoting their products also have to go through the live scan. So all of that will be kept on record and documented um, within our facility available for audit at any time. Um, but we'll comply with all of those, all of those guidelines. The state kind of crafts out a very stringent uh, policy on vendor access and how, what type of vendors and what the requirements are for them to be able to access your facility and um, do any type of work or services within that facility. And the other, I thought I read somewhere that the employees had to be screened by our city manager or somebody from the city? Yes, the city in issues a, uh, a license to, to every employee as well as the business. So that will apply to the vendors also? We're going to need to explore this whole vendor concept. There were some things mentioned tonight that cause us some questioning and concerning for you know, yoga classes, for example, would not be a permitted use under the CUP. Got it. Okay, so we can adjust that. we're not really clear on what they want to do. The, C the CUP restrictions are still in place as to what they are, and if they're trying to go outside that scope, I think we're going to need to ta talk a, a little bit more specifically with the applicant to make sure they understand the limitations of the CUP. Um, did I understand that you said that once the marijuana reaches its uh, uh, expiration, 
Yes. And it, it it's uh, sealed in the bag, that sort of thing. Did you say that it was mixed with another chemical to render it? Ha- yes, make? it has to be mixed with, and they don't specify exactly what you can mix it with. They give examples. Um, so one of the examples that the state gives is um, you could take grinded up cardboard and mix it with the cardboard. It has to be 50%, a 50% minimum mix. Um, that way, if somebody were to pull it out of a trash can, they can't go put it in a pipe or something and, and smoke it. Um, and so we have to comply with those state guidelines when it comes to, to waste management and, and disposal. Um, okay, so then it's not innate, then it's not, it's still, there's some still some THC level to it. There is you still some. You just have to mix it with something correct. to make it undesirable or. Right, correct. Yeah, there's not a way to really dispose of it unless you're incinerating it or something of that sort. Um, to make it unusable, but what mixing it does is it, it deters um, a person from being able to to readily just pick it up and, and smoke it or eat it or whatever may have you. And then, no, I didn't want a, some crafty guy at the waste disposal turning into a business owner itself. Right, true. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. Any other? Uh, yes, sir. Mm-hmm. Yes, Commissioner Chair. Garris. Welcome to step two. Because you're you. at step two. You're here to try to obtain a condition of approval or use permit. And these are the questions that we're asking you to see if you're going to follow the law of the federal, state, and ours. Because we are thinking of our city, like many of us already mentioned. And we want to hear what you have to say. And that's important to us. Okay? I like the 75 cameras inside and I like the 25 outside so you're going to have a view of whatever's there because I took five pictures of the place and I know what the place looks like because I've been there three times to really look at it to examine um, what's around it and um, and I know there's um, businesses up the street Best Western and everything on across the street from it and then there's two on the corner Jack in the Box and uh, Del Taco on the other side of uh, the business and um What I want to know, if by any chance, if there's a crime that occurs in the facility of the area or on the lot, does our law enforcement have the, are uh, granted to be able to look at the surveillance tapes without having go through a process of getting a, a court order? Absolutely. Our security cameras will be interfaced with the uh, sheriff's department here or with the local PD. Um, We're working with the IT department to make sure we're in compliance of the proper gateways to allow access. Um, If there's a crime that occurs within the vicinity or on the property, um, your staff will have direct access to pull video as needed. That's part of your code, and we will comply with that. Great. Thank you. My other one is always as order control plan. Because you're using carbon. Now, the question is, do you have already other suspensories in other areas of the state? Yes, we have quite a few um, cultivation, actually. And with the cultivation, you have a much stronger odor versus um, dispensing. Um, Dispensing, there's not going to really be any open um, marijuana. Uh, We will have packaging in the back, so you're going to have the process of breaking it up which is where we're going to have an extensive amount of carbon filters so with the carbon filters so you get a better understanding of it exactly how they work is the carbon is what filters the smell Um, the use of the carbon filters creates a negative airflow and a negative air pressure within the facility utilizing that negative air pressure you're able to pull all the air from the outside in so when a door is opened um, all that air is sucking in, so you never have smell that's, that's leaking out of the building. Everything's getting s- filtered through the carbon filters and then released through the ceilings. Um, if at any point in time we do have odor issues, um, then we move to step two. Step two is a, is a combination of ozone filters and a combination of um, hydrogen peroxide scrubbers. Um, and those, it's, it's a molecular... Um, it's a me- molecular working uh, filter that pulls the air in, it, bond, it bonds the smells and the, um, to, to, the, 
to the metals in it and, and it, it, it helps reduce some of the odors. Um, that's step two if, if we have any types of issues. Um, we've been very successful in various cities and every city that we've operated that we do not have any odor control issues. Um, so I, I, I don't feel that we'll have any in, in this particular case. My next question is, I know you're going to be doing upgrades on the building. Yes. And you're going to be replacing the glass to a double pane glass because that's what I read. According to the Chapter 5 City Ordinance, they require you or they require that no cannabis or anything will be displayed or see through the window. In other words, if I walk by, I should not be able to see anything on the other side of the, the glass, what's inside the dispensary or the vendors. So are you going to darken the double pane windows? Yes, what will happen is the double pane windows are being put in for energy efficiency um, as well as security. Um, throughout that process, what you have on the first floor, there's actually a false wall, which is called out on the plans. If you look at some of the fine print, um, that will cover the bottom floor windows. So if you're walking around the building, those windows will be blacked out. They will. We wanted to keep the windows so the aesthetics of the building remain in place. Um, and by adding the wall, the false wall inside, it gives us a level of security, also gives us state compliance, and it prohibits the ability to see in the, into that window straight into the dispensary. On the second floor, um, there will be no dispenser, uh, no product visible, but what we do plan on doing is putting some of that, um, that film. It's a film that you can see out. Um, it's a tint, but it's, it's, it's a series of small dots, um, and that will go on the, on the building also, and that will help prohibit prohibit if somebody were to hopefully it doesn't happen but say throw a rock or something like that it would hold the window from shattering got one more question when you close at 10 o'clock at night or whenever the staff leaves and you're the last one to leave how is the security from on the other side of the glass going to prevent somebody from breaking the glass and getting in so the, to prevent somebody from breaking the glass and getting in our first line of security we're going to rely on is the is, is, uh, nighttime security guard. We're going to have 24 hour security oh, on, on yeah. premise at all times. So that will be our first line of security. Being that we're near the freeway and, and a highway, uh, we've been talking with 3M and they recommended that fine dotted film to go on because it's also a vandal proof. Um, so if somebody was to say throw a rock or shoot it with a BB gun or something like that, it would prevent the window from being broken. Um, by the time police are dispatched, it would it, it would hold the window together long enough to prevent somebody from being able to get through that window in a timely fashion. You're not going to have a gate or nothing on the other side? We don't plan to have a gate because on the bottom floor there will be no exposed windows from the inside. All the windows on the inside will be four feet or above, and that will be on the right-hand side. Um, on the dispensary side, there will be a false wall um, around the existing windows from the inside. For, so from the inside, when you're in within the dispensary, you'll have the, the visualization that there is actually no windows. Thank you so much for answering our questions. Absolutely. In the event of a break-in, and I'm just curious, is the product secured within the building, or is it still out on display? No, so I, the product is secure within the building at all times. So in the dispensary portion, um, as you see in your, in your handout, they are the product is put into an airtight, um, smell-proof container. That's locked down to a... Um, to a table which cannot be removed at the end of every night that product in there has to be removed locked away as well as a product that is behind the counters that is dispensed out to the public uh, once it's purchased all of that goes into a secure room so we didn't call out some of the security details just we don't need it available to the public but in the secured room um, which is in the micro side of the business it's going to be built as a vault um, within that room there's going to be multiple saves that will house um, the cannabis that that is to remain on site because it is a micro license there will be a substantial amount at any given time of cannabis on site as it's being processed there and packaged there and things of that sort so this is something that you have to open and set the place up each and correct every day. correct so each day they would be required to come in say you know 30 minutes before shift um load everything onto the carts roll it into the dispensary and then stock their back stock um the back stock is in a secured area as well as you'll see a pass through from um, from a hallway into a to a security area before you can get into the actual dispensary area. So all of the product in that secured, um, I think it's called out of the storage area, will be that's back stock for the staff. So as as the 
public makes their purchases, um, then it will be pulled from back stock and then distributed once it's once the purchase is made. Now, in prior uh, dispensaries, I was under the impression that when somebody goes, do they have to be buzzed in? They will have to be buzzed in. So our security plan calls for a um, like a trap type access, right? Like we would find in a pawn shop. So instead of having a big cage and that big ugly deterrent um, that you see when you walk into a pawn shop, what we've done is our security plan calls out that the front door is interlocked with the dispensary door. So there can, there's no, there won't be an ability for somebody to do, say, a snatch and grab. Um, in order to open that front door, the dispensary door has to be locked. And in order to open the dispensary door, the front door has to be locked. So say they work together. So one would tell, the door one will say, hey, I'm locked. You can go ahead and bust somebody into this door. And door two will say the same thing. And all of that will be controlled by either security guard or the sec secretary that's checking in each customer. Okay, I, I'm, I was just curious because it is very close to the 60 freeway. Yes. Um, and um, we have very big, big concern as far as. Yes, a big concern. Yeah. yeah. Rightfully so, they can get out of town. <laughs> okay, that's it. Chair, I got one more question. Oh, Mr. Harris. Um, the manufacturing part of your business, will you be actually manufacturing edible? cannabis products or will those be coming in from the outside? The edible products will be coming in from the outside to stock in the dispensary. The only thing that's going to be happening as of right now in the manufacturing side will be the actu actual packaging. Packaging. Right. Okay. So packaging of, of various flour into jars and then put into boxes and to be shipped and sort. Um, and then we may do some joint rolling and some vape pen filling. But that that's as far as we go. We won't be touching any type of edible products. Okay. Thank you. No problem. One more. I took a picture of the back. There's a metal gate, a roller, with a dumpster. Is that, is that where you're going to be using? Is that part of the building? Yes, that is part of the building. Um, and that back area that you see, um, kind of by that dumpster, Right. that area will be the shipping and receiving. So you see the whole area from where the light, the light fixture is right up through the top of the driveway. There will be that whole entire side is going to be gated. Okay. Um, it'll have wrought iron fencing. There'll also be wrought iron fencing on top of the existing white um, cinder block walls um, with the with the hook the hook style mm -hmm. um, to prevent anybody from jumping that and getting immediate access. Um, that area is for vendor pickup and trash disposal. So when a vendor arrives, they'll check in. Um, once they check in, they'll be given a ticket. A security guard will be dispatched to that side of the building. We'll open the gates and allow them access, whether they're loading or unloading or whatever may have you may have. So those plywoods will come off the wall. Correct. And then there will be metal doors, probably with alarm systems on them. Correct. Yeah, because I, I mean, I see everything. Yeah, so those plywoods actually go to the electric room. So we're going to isolate that electric room from the inside so that there can be no access through the electric room into the facility. Um, and once that's isolated, where the roll-up door is, there's a man door to the right of the roll-up door. Um, that will be a solid metal door as well that is alarmed and also key card, key card access only. Great. I, I, I need to ask the question because I... The public, the, the residents are listening, there's the public that's, that are listening, and, and we want to ensure them that you're going to be doing everything correctly according to what the staff put on the, re on the report. Absolutely. That's why we're asking the question, and, and I'm deeply grateful for you asking them, you know, and giving us Absolutely. answers. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Is there any uh, more questions that we'd like to ask of the applicant? Thank you. Welcome. So There's at this time, uh, now open the uh, for open the Sims. public hearing. I'm sorry. Can I interrupt for just one moment? Relative to the question that was asked about um, people outside maybe potentially loitering, there is a section in our zoning code under the cannabis regulations, general business requirements, that states that you they cannot um, smoke or consume products outside of the business. So I think that would give you more. It's not restricted to a particular area. Thank you. Okay, at this time we'll now open uh, the, for the public hearing. Do we have any public testimony? We do. We have one. His name is Yakuba Brown.
Council, how are you this evening? My name is uh, Yacuba Brown, and I am a resident of Moreno Valley for over 15, 20 years now. Um, I have a youth organization that is here in the city of Moreno Valley called the FIATUM Group. It stands for Family is All That Matters. We cater to, we're 501c3 chartered with the state and with the IRS since 2005 for tutoring, mentoring, and physical fitness. Um, our understanding of the type of business that's coming into Moreno Valley and what they're required to do by the state and by the city is to give back uh, portions of proceeds to nonprofit organizations. Um, we were blessed to meet uh, Chris and his partner, and we have had several conversations with regards to whom the entity that they are giving back to, what charitable entity that they're giving back to. Um, with the expansion that we have with our organization, we service a little over 342 kids here in the city of Moreno Valley since 2010. I also have kids that are in Riverside, Temecula, Corona, uh, San Jacinto, and a couple that are in Banning. The expansion that we've been planning, myself and my partners, over the past five to six years, um, although we have investors and we are using investor dollars, to be a charitable organization and have an entity give back to us to continue to sustain what it is we're doing in the community is kind of vital to our expansion, even though it might not be a make or break, uh, but we are absolutely um, for what it is they're doing and we appreciate the offer to be the charitable event to cover the guidelines from the state and the city with regards to the business that they're bringing into Moreno Valley. Thank you for your uh, participation. Uh, are there any others? No, sir. Okay. Uh, would the uh, applicant like to address address any of the comments there made by the uh, public? Okay. So with that, I uh, will now close the public hearing and move on to deliberations. So, commission, it's time to deliberate. I'm just happy that um, that name was clarified, and um, <laughs> it's not funny. I really do. I, I'm really happy about that. I was very upset when I came in. Um, so, in the future, I kind of to alleviate any of this. It would be nice if they did specify exactly what the name will be on the business itself, and that way any confusion. Any sleepless nights <laughs> would, you know, be alleviated. So um, I'm just happy with that, and I'm happy with everything. And I know that the staff makes everybody and the city makes everybody comply with the rules. And um, I, uh, I don't see a problem with it. You know, I'm, I'm for it. Commissioner oh, Regina? sure. <laughs> um, no, I, I uh, thank the applicant for coming up, and you really were very concise about answering some of our questions and uh, alleviating some of our, our uh, misconceptions. Um, and I'm really happy to hear that this is the first one that I've heard about uh, some charitable give back. I mean, this is fantastic. I'd say uh, spread that out, you know. Um, there's plenty of um, youth groups and plenty of folks in Marina Valley that uh, are nonprofit and can use some... Uh, a business that's just willing to uh, help the, the city grow from the the immense amount of money that we know that's going to go into this business. So thank you. Anybody else? Um, I think all my questions were answered, and it, it, I'm going to vote for approval. Yeah. Yes, Chair. I want to address Tom Gerald's concern. This is why it's important that we, the commissioners, read over the staff and the chapters carefully to ensure them that everything that we're going to do is for their safety, our safety, because we're all residents here. We live here. And I like 
the order control plan. I'm always going to hit on that because that those words that are here, this this system will. It doesn't say maybe. It's supposed to do something. Will ensure that the order absorbed by the dispensary are not detectable outside the premises, including the parking lot, public right away, and the adjacent businesses. That's very important to me to know that that rule it's in here. The other thing I like about this applicant's um, um, case is the cameras. They're going to be all over the place. So if there is a crime, they are giving permission for our deputies to go in and look at it and solve that crime without having to go through the process of getting a, a court order. That's very important for us to solve the crime as quickly as possible without the parade. The other thing is you got to be 21 and over. That's a must. So I understand about the hotel that's up the street that hosts activities. And yes, there are going to be youngsters that are going to come out and use the fast food lane, McDonald's, the taco, and all that good stuff that's there. That's why it's important about the odor, because when they go by this building, they're not going to smell it. And the other thing is that they're not going to have a sign facing the street that's going to say marijuana or marijuana. It's not going to do that. So the kids are going to go by like they've never been there before. That's a good thing. And that's why security is important, that they do their part. It's, it's nothing wrong by being kind, but tough love is better because that's what we want in the city of Moreno Valley. I'm glad that, that the commissioner got the sign thing or the name, because I had a little trouble with the first one. I didn't care about marijuana, because, you know, a, a business would say tires, food. I just looked at the name Moval. Moval belongs to us. I don't want that to be, to be mistreated. We're not a city of, you know, of doing things wrong. We're just trying to comply with the law that was passed by Jerry Brown and passed by the public or the residents of the city of Miranda Valley. We just want things to be fair. I like this project because the advocate, he answered our questions. He was straightforward, and that's what I wanted to hear, the advocate to communicate with us. And he did a great job. And he answered my questions, and I'm grateful for him. And I don't know what's going to happen to the project, but I do like it. Um, I'd just like to say um, I agree with Joanne and Rafael as far as the name goes. Uh, I went from thinking that this was going to look kind of ghetto with the name Moval Marijuana to thinking, well, this is going to be uh, a really classy-looking uh, building um, with the name Empire on it, and, and I think it's going to be a good project. Okay, I, I also, uh, I, you know, wherever you fall on the uh, whole cannabis operation and that vote that went down on the state, but it, this is, uh, I am glad to see that this uh, commercial project or property is going to be put back into some use. And uh, it's going to get updated, and so that's good. It's going to have job creation. It looks like uh, the city and, and the staff is uh, well, taking a fine-tooth comb through the uh, municipal code and, and conditioned it appropriately. So do I have a motion from uh, one of the commissioners, what they want to do? I'll make the motion. I make a motion that we approve resolution number 2019-26. Do we have a second? I second. Okay, we have a, a first and a second. Um, Commissioner Korzak with the first and uh, Commissioner Stevens with the second. Do we have a vote? Look at that, it's approved. Unanimously. So do we have a staff wrap up? 
Thank you. Yes, the action taken tonight by the Planning Commission uh, is an appealable action. Any interested party would need to file an appeal within 15 days of this action. The appeal must be in writing directed to the Community Development Director uh, stating the specific reasons for the appeal along with the appropriate fee. Uh, if an appeal was received, the item would be agendized for a future City Council meeting. Thank you. Great. Thank you. <coughs> All right. Uh, moving right along now to the next item, which is item number two, a request for a conditional use permit. It's PEN 18-0205 for a 78-unit transitional care housing facility or an assisted living complex. Um, the applicant is Aegis Development Services. Uh, so, um, welcome to here, staff. Senior Planner Chris Ormsby will present the staff report. Great. Thank you. Uh, Chair Sims and members of the Planning Commission, I do want to acknowledge that the staff work on this project was completed by Kimberly Luna. She's an intern working with us. Uh, she's a graduate student at University of California, Riverside. Uh, unfortunately, she cannot be here this evening because of a conflict with the class, but she was looking forward to presenting to the Planning <laughs> Commission. The applicant is requesting approval of a conditional use permit uh, to allow a 78-unit transitional care assisted living a complex on a little more than a three-acre site. There are a few aspects of the use that I should highlight. The project, which is being called Horizons at Merino Valley, uh, will be for residents 55 or older. It will <laughs> essentially be an independent living environment, but there will be assistance provided or available on the site. That assistance would include uh, assistance such as daily living activities, bathing, dressing, and grooming, medication management, and reminders. In addition, there will be other services provided, uh, concierge services, which would include transportation to commercial centers, social activities, and uh, in addition, meal preparation. Also, there'll be some potential social events, exercise and wellness classes, uh, and so forth. The site is located on the south side of Box Springs Road, immediately west of Kenyon Springs Plaza, or west and north of Kenyon Springs Plaza. The adjacent plaza is starting to see some renewed economic energy. There's a golden corral under construction, and that will provide some opportunities for uh, seniors uh, to be close to uh, uh, some commercial options. As mentioned, the site is community commercial zoning now. It's in a location that really doesn't lend itself to commercial development, not being on a, a corner location and being sort of uh, uh, on Box Springs Road, which doesn't see the traffic levels of, of some of the other major commercial streets. Therefore, it lends itself to some alternative land use, such as the one under consideration. And the assisted living facility is a permitted use with a conditional use permit. Uh, moving on to the site plan, the, uh, basically it's uh, 78 uh, units total. There are 60 one-bedroom uh, units and 18 two-bedroom. Uh, <laughs> the site plan layout, there's one access point from Box Springs Road uh, with the ability to circulate on the site. Uh, there will be a number of amenities provided on the site, including a fitness wellness center, pool and spa, lounge and club room, and offices for the assisted living facilities or services. Regard to the, with regard to parking, uh, the parking analysis prepared by the consulting firm of Environment Planning Development Solutions Incorporated concluded that parking provided is adequate for the site. Uh, this was based on Institute of Transportation Engineers Parking Generation a document. A total of 93 parking spaces uh, would be required and 99 are provided. The elevations provide a fair amount of variation and, and such in terms of the uh, all sides. There's some use of stone accents and some variations in color. We did place a uh, condition on the project to provide some additional detailing around certain windows, uh, for example, on the areas that project where the uh, balconies are located. 
And, and just here we provided the example as far as the materials so that the colors actually I think are, are maybe more attractive than they are represented in the actual rendering. The project proposes numerous design and uh, convenience amenities as mentioned uh, for this project. Uh, we already talked about the, the courtyard which has a pool spa and some, some other uh, recreational opportunities there. In addition, there will be uh, community gardening and a, a dog walking path for residents with pets along the very south edge of the property. The project has been determined uh, uh, to be uh, qualify as a Class 32 uh, categorical exemption under CEQA, uh, which is an infill exemption uh, because it does meet all of the conditions that are required for that particular exemption. The applicant did provide some Considerable, considerable documentation of that for staff and we worked with them to uh, review that and, and we concur with it. With that then, the staff recommends that the Planning Commission approve Resolution 2019-25 as recommended in the staff report. Just one additional comment, we did receive one phone <laughs> call, just an inquiry with regard to the uh, what the project was, that no concerns were expressed with the project. And with that, I'll open up to questions of staff. Thank you. Uh, do we have a uh, question by commissioners of staff? Um, I have one question. And, uh, <clears throat> under special conditions, uh, B, page 51, um, <clears throat> any use uh, which would cause sunlight to be reflected toward any uh, aircraft engage in initial straight climb uh, to take off towards aircraft engage and straight final approach. Um, I guess it's I guess that's saying that when the construction is going up, um, the windows have to be uh, uh, built a certain way that they don't cause sunlight in order to re uh, to reflect towards I guess March Air Force Base or anything like that. Um, I, I was looking for anything in the in the building plans that showed any type of uh, building for. I, I've seen others where they said yes, we're going to use a certain type of window or that won't uh, cause any reflections. Is does this one have? Did this project have anything like that? Uh, this is actually a standard condition of the Airport Land Use Commission. The project was reviewed by the commission. In in this case. Windows generally wouldn't be considered reflective. Solar panels would be. So if they were to add solar panels later, that would be something that we would have to, to possibly bring back to the Airport Land Use Commission. But generally, windows are, you know, if there was some reflectivity of materials being used during construction, as you mentioned, which is a good point, then that might be a consideration. But here, uh, based on our experience with the Airport Land Use Commission, there would not likely to be any any, any issues in that regard. You know, uh, there's a little speak speak button on here, so if you guys will ever use that, then I can see who's in line. But that's okay. If you don't want to, that's also all right, too. <laughs> but whoever wants to go next can go next. Uh, I was just wondering how many of these units are going to be ADA um, compliant? For that, I'll, I'll defer to the, uh, the applicant, but they will have to meet the uh, building code with requirement for ADA. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I have a question. I went over and I looked at it, and there is from the curve, there's no way, there's no sidewalk, there's nothing there. I mean, you got to park your car around the corner and then walk up to the project. How is that going to be done? What are they going to do in the front of, of the fence? Uh, are well, going to put sidewalks? Or what, what, what are they going to do? Are they going to have the street and then a sidewalk? Yes, uh, there will be sidewalk as shown on the, you well, can see it on the landscape plan. So there'll be some uh, generous landscape setback behind the sidewalk. It appears to be curb adjacent sidewalk. Uh, so that will all meet the city standards for the uh, infrastructure. Okay. And to my surprise, when I parked my vehicle, I didn't realize that I was parking on someone's property. I realized there was a mailbox there and I was on someone's property. So I backed out 
and I realized there's a house way in the back of an uh, of the uh, of someone else's property, and I saw the fence, and then there's the fence towards the plaza. Before the fence towards the plaza, there's a gap in between the two fences. Is that part of the project? It's like a it's like a driveway on the corner. Well, I'm not sure if you're referring to the property line. There, there is a property in between this property and the, the multifamily under construction. Are you referring to the, the back of the site? No, well, okay, if I, if I stood in front of the, the, the project, to my left. Okay. To my left, there's like a, a driveway, then, then there's the plaza. There's a gap in there. Is that part of the property that the, the houses are going to be built on? <coughs> It's my understanding it, it would be, but we can uh, we could take a look at the aerial photo here. But it, um, yeah, all the, the raw land up to the commercial center is part of the this project. But the applicant may be able to shed some additional light on that. At this site. Okay. Oh, there, oh, there it is. Okay. Okay. So, so I'm looking at the project, and. Um, not with the house, but on my right-hand side, there's a gap in there on the project site. Right there, there's a little gap, and there's a driveway that takes you back onto um, oh, that site's off in there. Yeah. Um, Box Springs. So I, I'm just wondering, are they going to use that gap all the way to the fence of the of the plaza? Am I? You, yes, it would extend all the way on the east side okay. um, to the plaza. Okay, good. I, I'm just wondering that that we don't leave that gap, and then in the future we can't do nothing with it. You know, say because that's the, one of the problems that we have in Moreno Valley. We have so many little lots. Okay. Um, I commend the report because I have a father that's disabled and living in Puerto Rico, and he's being taken care of. So when I started to look at this project. I wrote down, what is it? What are we building there? Because I saw stoves, swimming pools. I mean, I saw a lot of good things that my father don't have. So I was wondering, how do you take care of someone that's this, you know, that has a, that disability? So I understood by you now mentioning, it's like a two-phase, independent, because I have uh, in-laws, my sister-in-laws, they live in Florida, and they live in a two-bedroom apartment, but no one's taking care of them. But everybody else outside of that, someone is taking. So I understand now what the project is being built, how it's being built. And that's a good thing. And I'm glad it goes down to 55, you know, instead of 62 or 65, I mean, you know. But I'm glad. Um, I look forward to it. I, I, I thank the fire department for being involved once again. I like the word, um, that, little, that little word there, um, Lock box or whatever it is, that little box is there also to ensure that if anything happens in that building, they'll be able to get in and help the seniors. Because once again, I believe that our seniors in the city of Marina Valley is our jewels. I call them jewels because they have taught me personally how to do things to be where I'm at today. So in return, I read this report in their behalf to make sure everything's done safely for them. And I'm glad that the fire department is involved in all this too. Really, thank you. Any other uh, commissioner questions of staff? Okay, at this time, if the applicant would like to uh, come up and uh, give a presentation or address the commission. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Commission Jeremy Kraut, uh, applicant's representative. Thank you for uh, having us here tonight and hearing the project. We're thrilled to be in front of you to present this project to one that is, I think, as you're hearing from uh, your commissioner and probably from other people in the community, something that's needed with the, the uh, demographic change that I think every area is, is facing, the aging of population. So uh, we're, we're thrilled to be here, and, and we worked really hard with the staff. We want to thank your, your staff, who is uh, attentive, diligent, and uh, very responsive in, in a process like this that um, you know, everybody has to go through to get a, a, something built. So we're, we're thrilled to be working with your team. Um, I, I, my presentation doesn't have a whole lot more to offer beyond what uh, you heard from your, your staff, I, except that I just wanted to add that you know, th this project does have, um, and I 
Maybe there is one. Uh, is there a clicker over here? Oh, excuse me for a moment. Um, a name that we think might be uh, appropriate for this. We really, um, th this is a name that it's being used in other communities. Uh, they have another site in, in Calabasas that is, um, I think, well received up there, and uh, really excited to bring this uh, brand to the to the community. Uh, yeah, we talked about the site um, for the moment here, and I think the one thing I, I just wanted to add as far as some of the assisted living services, which may speak to what you were talking about, some of the benefits that community members would have or resident residents would have here. Uh, really, the, the elements that, that people do need as they age uh, and, and is helpful for um, residents that, that may be here, is, it's uh, related to really the assistance with daily activities, uh, the bathing, dressing, grooming. Uh, it's, a, it's a real benefit to have that on-site, on, on in-house, essentially, to be able to offer that to the residents. Meal preparation assistance, medication management and reminders, all those things that, you know, that it just is a little bit harder as, as we age to um, to administer and to keep track of. So those are very helpful. Transportation and companion uh, companionship to appointments, those are obviously important too. Not everyone will have the benefit of a family there to uh, help one of the residents in many ways. And, and it's nice that those services could be offered on site so they could continue to have a life, uh, a relatively free life uh, in this capacity. So uh, social activities are, are obviously really important to communities like these to uh, encourage people to stay longer. I think the more they offer in a community, the more that people want to stay there. So to that end, they, they really encourage these social activities. And then, of course, you know, housekeeping and other elements to, to assist with. It's, um, you know, not all the times is it easy to do all the trash and other things that you uh, we have to deal with on a regular basis uh, as you age. So, and then basic first aid, of course, is important uh, in the area. So, uh, or in this community, uh, really, our, our attentive to design, our architect and, and engineer are here in the audience. If you do have any specific questions about materials, these are some of the examples of some of the projects uh, the architect has worked on. Um, and then we, we, I think you heard from your staff all the amenities that are on site. So, don't need to go into that in a lot of detail. But um, Commissioner Harris, I believe, asked the question about. Uh, ADA uh, for relative to the units, all of 100% of them are ADA compliant in terms of being adaptable to. So not all residents will have ADA needs, but they each of them, each of the units could be adaptable to have lower sinks uh, or lower countertops. They all have that ability to do that. So as the residents' needs are, are determined, either through the, the signing of a lease and uh, explaining the needs, they could be adapted to that person's needs, or if they through their uh, term or living at the facility, they become disabled, they could adapt them very easily. And then beyond that, just like any facility like this, the restrooms and other public space or quasi public spaces are already uh, ADA compliant in terms of um, anybody that comes in would have to be able to have access to that. So uh, I don't know if there are any other questions that you want me to address, but I'm happy to answer any and thank you for your time. I, I do, yeah, this is a, uh so, so how many, uh, an operation like this with, uh, what would you say, 78 dwelling units or living spaces there, uh, what kind of staffing is in, involved in this and, and the uh, shifts? Is this a 24-7 staffed operation and kind of what do you think as far as uh, staffing? Um, yeah, so, there, job creation? so there's a couple, yeah, it, it's a good question. So the, I don't know if we have a floor plan on one of the, <coughs> Do you have a, a floor plan by chance? I don't think I included it in mine. Um, yeah, I did not. Um, yeah, I don't think I had a floor plan. But I in the floor plan, if you have the plan package in, uh, in front of you, there's, it might be easier. Oops, I'm sorry. Let me stop pushing buttons and all. <laughs> but you're, um, you'll see a number of uses within the building. So you have uh, managers, you have uh, people that are uh, in the leasing side of, uh, of the facility, you have catering er, in terms of um, areas for food preparation and for receiving of food that's coming in. So there are, there are a number of people that would be there. In addition, for a lot of these um, services that are being offered, not all of those are uh, on-site staff 100% of the time. They, they'd be coming in as needed. So as the needs come up for each of the residents, they may be coming in on a more frequent basis. So uh, at uh, like the first occupancy, maybe 20% of the people will need 
some of these services. So they'll come on uh, on site to provide those services on a regular basis. And then at, it, maybe over time, the residents would change and have a, more needs. So they'd be coming more frequently. So um, you know, as far as number of people, it'd, it'd be typically about five people there on site for daytime. And then there would be 24 seven for somebody there to be available in case somebody needs that. But then they can also call to have emergency lines, not just for emergency personnel of the city or hospital, other staff, but it'd be also for um, non-emergency, emergency, I guess you could say, just urgent needs where you'd have help with some of the things that are listed there that they could call on and those people would have access to come into the facility to provide those. Thank you. Any, any other questions of uh, yeah, the applicant? At some point, um, would some of the residents be um, they get seriously ill or more ill and they're not going to really recover, are they going to be sent to like a skilled nursing facility? Uh, so um, glad you brought that up. This is considered uh, not a skilled nursing. Right. So um, that there is not a nursing personnel or nurse or a medical professional on staff to provide that. They could come on site to assist with any uh, medical needs, but there isn't. This is not a skilled nursing. So, yet yes, if if the needs were great enough to require an actual skilled nursing facility, which is more on the medical side of the range of of, um, uh, of housing, uh, they would potentially have to go somewhere else if they could not provide that in this facility. But they could also, if there's ability to bring a you know a nurse in or somebody with medical professional ability, they could come into the site to provide certain um, of the. Uh, needs that, that the resident may have. And just to educate the public, what does transitional care mean exactly? So the uh, idea in this is that people that there's um, skilled nursing, there are a number of different housing types for, for senior, uh, for people with certain needs, especially in the senior um, citizen range of, of people. And, and those are um, related to Use, or uh, services like these. So in this case, not everyone is going to need these services and not everyone has to buy those services, I guess you could say, when they come into the, the, um, the, the facility. As compared with a, a full assisted living that has 100% of that provided 100% of the time, meaning that if you rent or lease in the facility, they have to use those services. They're paying for them right out the gate here they don't have to pay for it. They could opt out of it or they could opt into it. So it's a, it, it's a balance because the full assisted where you have to, assisted living where you have to buy those services, you're, you're, you're gonna be paying a lot more. So this is a more affordable option for people that may need some, but not all the services, services or they transition into those services over time and they can opt in for that. So this is kind of like a senior apartment complex with a smorgasbord of options uh, that they need to well, use or not use. Yeah, so it's a little different in the in terms of the layout. So it's a typical senior apartment community would not have all the other functions on site. So on the first floor of this facility, they have a lot more functionality that are, are providing the ability to provide. The, the, the services like these could be offered on a immediate basis. A senior apartment community would be much like any other apartment community you walk into, they just have a lobby with maybe a leasing person that could greet you and then the amenities that are related to apartment community. This is different in that there are other functions on site as you walk in, you'd have all those other things that allow this to happen. So uh, a little different. Commissioner Harris. Um, <clears throat> what is a large butler kitchen? So uh, that's kind of in that um, uh, category about the meal preparation and assistance. So I every resident uh, or residence, I should say, has a kitchen. It's, it's not going to be, uh, these are, are smaller units for people that would desire that sort of living, not, you know, these, these aren't going to be grandiose kitchens for every person to have, you know, uh, this luxury apartment experience. They will be really nice and, and accommodated well for the residents, but they won't have a grandiose kitchen. So um, for people that especially are needing meal preparation assistance, with a facility like this that'll have a, a company coming in and assisting with that, they need an area, especially if they're providing it for half, majority of all, or, or all the, the residents, they'll need an area, bring the food in, 
to lay it out and to prepare it and bring it up to the the units and that's what this is so it's not a it's not a commercial grade kitchen uh, uh, unless i'm mistaken yeah it's not a commercial grade kitchen where you're gonna have but you know, they will be able to do some meal prep yes exactly right on that site. exactly like a caterer could bring in the food exactly big stuff and big trays and then yeah. parse it down into individual servings right okay. right any hey. other uh, questions yeah, I got it. I have a question. So, so kind of, <clears throat> I'm glad you're here, and I'm glad you're answering questions. And I feel just like some of the commissioners. I believe is, or I, kind of, I believe now it's like an upscale um, senior center or residence for those to live, because everything that you mentioned is contract. The nurse comes in, the doctor comes in, the food comes in, everything's contract as they need it. A la carte. Okay. So, so it's like a high end, again, apartments for anyone that's 55 and over. And, and it also gives the option for um, assisted living for those that want to live in a nice neighborhood, in a nice apartment with a lot of nice stuff, okay? So that's what it, I feel it is. And there's nothing wrong with that as they need it. Like you said, they probably say money because with my dad, everything's included in one price. And, it, you know, but he needs that assistance. There's other people that may not need that assistance for the next five or ten years yet, you know, just like my sister's in-laws. And they're 95, and, they, and they're doing pretty well without this assistance. So for those that decide to rent one of your places and they live there for the next 10, 15, 20, 30 years and they get that old, they'll have that assistance there. But to me, it sounds like a high-end apartment or senior place, and that's okay. It's a good project. It's going to be put in the right place. It's going to be good for the city of Moreno Valley. They're going to have another option. But it's not more for the assisted living. It's more for independent than assisted living, okay? That, that's the way I feel now reading and then listening to everyone here. Like I said, it's a nice project. It's gonna be a nice area. It's gonna fill up that, that lot with, with something great instead of seeing the dirt in the weeds. And I'm happy, you know. Are we gonna have security cameras throughout the place? So there will be a, a security protocol to have security cameras and personnel to, to monitor the site. I don't have the number of cameras That's on okay. my no, I'm, I'm yes, just but asking there will the question. Be. Is, yeah. is there going to be security for the, for, for the 55 and over? Okay. Absolutely. You know, and again, um, so we're not going to have anybody 24 hours, nurse, nothing like that, doctor. I know you're going to have uh, a reception. It's going to be there 24 hours, right? Yeah, but the, uh, yeah. So the, when you're talking about medical professional, that is now getting into that skilled nursing, so that that's <coughs> different type of use than this one would be. Um, so that yeah, assisted living doesn't have that that use on, or that type of uh, personnel on site. They the people that have they may have some basic training, especially on uh, first aid administration, but uh, and then administration of of medication reminders and that sort of thing but they're not the the doctors that that you're referring to that would be in that skilled nursing and in other similar categories so if a tenant calls the reception for assistance maybe she fell she's able to go to the phone and call downstairs and ask for help does that person go upstairs to see what's going on by knocking on the door or do they dial 911 for them um, likely in a emergency situation, that would be a nine one one call. I, that's. All right. I, I, that. I just want to make sure that um, that I understand the project and I do. And like I said, if I was the one that wanted to live in a nice place like that, and I was fifty five and over, and I got tired of cutting grass, that's where I'll go, because you have everything that I need. And eventually, one day, I'll need assistance, and it's there. So good luck. I have a question. Um, I think there was Commissioner Harris. No, I, I just, if, if they have questions. 
have one quick question. Um, when my father was um, at that point where he did need assisted living, will, do you contract with the VA at all? Because I know that the VA pays for the veterans quite a substantial amount for their care. Do you do that at all? That, um, I don't believe that's the model here. I mean, the VA, I think that's a very specific category of provision of services. I, I'm, I'm familiar with um, facilities that are 100% VA uh, related, so they, they VA, no, but it, I know that's not what you're talking about here. I'm just, that's I, not in this case as far as I know. As far as No, because in Sun City, I was uh, looked at a place, and it wasn't just for veterans. It was for everybody. They just happened to have the staff had told me that the because he was a you know veteran World War II vet, he was entitled to a certain amount for assisted living, which was quite a large amount. It was like four thousand dollars or over four thousand dollars, five thousand dollars, and they contracted that way with the VA. So I was just wondering if that's something you guys did because I know we have a lot of military in our city. Yeah, it's a good question. I don't know if that's been explored at this point. I don't think they're excluding it, but I, I, I mainly was referring to it. I've, I've worked on another project that is 100% veterans, but I know that's not what you're referring to in this case. It's just something that um, I'm familiar with. I'm not familiar with that situation. Uh, my question would be, uh, it sounds great. This is, this is fantastic. I remember the, what somebody else came in with something similar. Say, wow, we need this in Marina Valley. My question would be this. If a person came in 55 and older and said, I want the bare minimum, smallest place, versus the person that came in and got the fully loaded version, is there a ballpark figure between the lowest and the highest? And, and as they go through the meld of services, are and I guess is a bifurcated question, um, are those services offset through Medi-Cal, um, medical services, you know, uh, Blue Shield, Blue Cross, you know, that sort of thing. So bottom line, what they would get if I came in at 55 and said, I want to just give me a room <laughs> or the guy come in, I want, I want the Cadillac with all the bells and whistles. <laughs> uh, I don't have rates on that, um, but it, it certainly, so the, the bare bones, I think one thing that I'd want to point out uh, to address the, the point about is this the same as senior apartments again these are these uh, units are designed to uh, be supplemental or i guess complementary to the uses on site so not all of the units are going to have again this bigger kitchen that you'd expect in a normal senior apartment that's fully independent living you're going to they get to benefit from the other facilities on site to help reduce the need for bigger kitchens or other bigger uses so they because they have other facilities on site that provide that in addition they may be paying it's a nicer facility so they may be paying more if it was a like for like senior apartment where a senior apartment with nothing available to it and it's this senior in this facility a, a, a transitional senior care that has options that they can utilize on site and 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 again ramp up from no need to some need um, so they because this is just there's going to be more convenience and other options available to somebody so they if that was exam but there isn't really one thing i wanted to point out in my presentation that i didn't yet is one thing that uh, is really important is there are really no uh, very very few or no available uh, options for seniors in this area that i've got a list of them and there's a lot of them are about single family homes have been converted to allow for multiple people to be on site uh, in assisted living fashion and so there's just really not that many around there a lot of them are in different cities and and what what are available are pretty limited so you know having that option f in in the area is important so um, it's hard to compare exactly what the price range would be and so what there's going to be a testing of the market uh, to answer your question to find out what exactly what the rate would be but certainly somebody as you get increased needs even somebody that is in a wheelchair that would have um, more in, uh, intensive needs from <coughs> bathing and clothing and and food prep. The you know the price range may go up from there, but that also could be supplemented by insurance or other means that a uh, person would have available to them. But uh, certainly on the medical side, that's definitely covered by health care. And some people have more long-term care insurance that, but some people haven't paid for that. So there there would be a balancing of what they could purchase and and uh, have available to them. Well, I guess what I was driving at is a person comes in. And I, I would imagine they have some certain, I, I see a lot of uh, amenities here. Um, and there's some basic things they would get just for staying. Oh, yeah. And then as they, they, they stay there, they say, you know, their needs can increase. Sure. 
So then I guess from there at, at the basic, at the bottom level, and, and Mr. Johnson is going around and said, no, Mr. Johnson, you don't have that service available to you. We have to go to the management office to add that service. I, I take it to be something like that. that. That's true. So they would, a number of the things like the social activities um, and, and the, there was transportation, not everybody needs that, but that is obviously an important thing to have available. Medication management and reminders, there's at least some basic uh, offering of that. But then if you have you know, somebody coming into you, to the unit to help them with administering, that may be an extra charge, but it is going to be a menu available. And certainly the market may dictate uh, some of this actually becoming a, a base level offering, and some of it may be you know, price that you know, people re really want and they're willing to pay something for or the insurance is able to pay for it. So, yeah, there, there will be some base offerings that's different than just a standard apartment community, and that's, that's an important part of this facility. And I, I guess my last question would be, um, in dealing with some seniors uh, myself um, and volunteering, there's some seniors that would be uh, sometimes unsafe to themselves, leaving the gas on, you know, maybe leaving the water running, that sort of thing. And uh, so I guess what safety measures would be in place for seniors that would be living there that could possibly cause harm to themselves or someone else? Uh, so one element that's important is, you know, social activities are both a function of providing people a network or community to, to um, integrate themselves into, but also a way to, for, for safety measures. So you know, they, they do have regular people that, uh, regular occurrences to bring people out of their units to come into the more common areas. So if they see people not attending those, they'd, they'd, I think, alert somebody to go check on that on the person. In addition, with people on, on staff in the facility that see people coming and going, and uh, because there are more common areas, it, it brings people out of their unit. If they don't see people coming, they'd go and check on them. Um, so I think there are a lot of those elements that are kind of built in safety measures because of the community that's formed in these facilities. And then, yeah, if, if they don't see people coming in and out on a regular basis, I think that would really alert staff to go and check on them on a regular basis to see that would happen. So, and then obviously when people have some of the, the services that are from medication reminders and others, then that's, uh, that is somebody going to the unit to, if they're not coming out to take their regular medication to go check on them to um, provide that. So um, then beyond that, you know, there obviously there's building measures that, you know, from fire uh, suppression and, and alerts. You know that it's gone. It'll be going through the fire uh, uh, plan check process to ensure that each unit has all the obviously the fire and life safety measures that are uh, would be expected. I have one more because he brought up a, a, a concern. Is the building open 24 hours or is there open and close? Open at eight, close at nine, and no one can come out because I think of um, um, seniors, and it, it don't have to be seniors, let's say 55 and over, may have dementia. Yeah, it, so uh, that'd be an important point. This is not a, a memory care facility, but, but yeah, but yeah, they, right. I mean, they're living it, there it, and, it, and it occurs while they're living there for five years. Right, no, yeah. They're, what they're, happens exactly. while they're wandering up and down the hallway? Um, so I, I guess the important thing, yes, there would be a, a locked down point. So like early, uh, you know, late at night to, or at some point during the evening to early in the morning, it, it would be locked. So not everybody could, any, anybody in the public could come into the facility. They'd have to buzz in and get, you know, admitted to, to allow in. As far as the residents, this doesn't have a, a, um, a lockdown like the memory care uh, uh, facility might. So like if, you know, some, if a resident wanted to leave, they could. Right. And so, uh, you know, that would be obviously an Im imperative for the staff and residents to recognize when somebody's going that direction and becoming a danger to themselves or to the community uh, to, to come out of there. So they would be, they'd have to be referred out of the facility into um, somewhere where that could accommodate that uh, type person so that they, they wouldn't be a, a safety concern. So you, re you would recommend to the, to the tenant uh, uh, an alternative to have that care somewhere else, not in this facility. It, yeah, they, they'd have to. Per, they'd say that this isn't. They, this is not safe for you to be in this facility. They'd have to refer them out, or you know, they, if there's if they're on the, I guess a 
a line very close to or not but not fully o over into full dementia you know there could be some of these services that could be provided if they don't have a family member that uh, to be with them from from a safety perspective thank you for your answer any other uh, questions of I don't have a question I'm just gonna make a comment like somebody perfectly healthy like myself and I'm well over 55 years old if I wanted to just not have to do anything and and just be cared for and pampered and have all the amenities that I want to have and you know I can live there and like Raphael said I, nobody's gonna put a, a requiring on me whether I could come and go right yeah if I have to stay there and and let's say yeah. I mean it's not going to be like a lockdown I mean <laughs> I can come and go and live my life and you know just have enjoy the pool and spa and have somebody make my meals and right. you know it's not totally just for people that are you know ill it could be for somebody that just wants to live their life out without having all the stress and everything that's correct right so that's what i wanted to say you, you know this sounds very analogous to the uh, air force village west i think it's called uh, alta vista now but this is on a much smaller uh, kind of scale but there it's for the all the uh, military folks but you can move in you can get like a three or four bedroom single family home and you know when you it's for seniors, and then once you scale down, you go, oh, I only want a condo. Then you can move to the condo. Oh, that's too much. And then you can go to the apartment. And if you don't like the apartment, then you can get into something more like this, transitional, all the way to the, you know, full-on assisted living, you know, medical care type thing. And then they can you check out and you go over to the VA. You know, so it's a full service over there. But this, this, this is somewhere in that kind of spectrum of... Uh, Um, if, if this project were to be approved tonight, when would you be prepared to start the project? Um, so as you know, with the construction permitting process at this stage for CUP, we get to a certain engineering and, and architectural scale and detail. Next step, if, if approved, would be to go into the construction design uh, detail, which takes a couple months at least to just prepare the plans. Uh, once those are submitted to the city, go through the plan check process, we'd estimate that to be anywhere between three and four months or something to get to permits and then construction after that. So I, I think you know, they're, they're anxious and interested to move forward. And uh, you know, if everything were to run smoothly through that uh, process, we'd, um, you know, it'd be a probably, um, you know, it's less than a year construction or about a year construction effort. So that's, um, that'd be about the rough timing. So there could be shovels in the ground within five months? Um, we'd love for that happen <laughs> yes no, okay. it's possible thank you okay any other uh, commissioner questions of the applicant all right thank you very much thank you and then uh, so this time uh, we can now open the uh, uh, public hearing do we have any public testimony yes sir we have Mara Swats Sweets. That's okay. It's my handwriting. Thank you. Um, no problem. Mara Sweets, and I'm a California real estate broker, and I'm here to represent the estate of Edie Mae Cranton, who owns the property of a single-family residence right next door to the applicant's proposal. And I want to make it really clear. We're not here for or against the property um, development, but what I am here for is um, – Edie May. She's a 96-year-old woman who lives in the home right now with a 70-year-old caregiver. And she's been in the home since the early 70s. Her husband had the home built for her. Um, she is a paralyzed, um, let's see, non-ambulatory dementia resident. And the trustee of the estate would like to see her grandmother live out her days in that home and only the good lord knows how long that will be and so what she is asking for and she hasn't had any specific problems with this particular development but in the past that the owner is entitled to 
a certain amount of rights as a property owner. We all know that when we own property here in California. But I'm only here to talk about one of those rights. And that right is her right of enjoyment. A right to live out her days there without water being cut off and power because it has happened in the past. She is the only single family resident left on that side of the block and there's been a lot of development over the years and she has lost most recently power literally all day. And so we're not talking about an inconvenience here, we're talking about a life and death situation. So all we request and want to know from the applicant is what are they prepared to do so power does remain on as they do their development um, um, with the property. That's all the trustee would like to know is that her grandmother was going to be able to be taken care of with running water and power um, in her home during this year. Not to mention the traffic that I would, I would assume that construction trucks will be there coming and going, possibly blocking her entrance. And so we'd like um, the panel to address that so that she can feel assured um, that that's not going to happen. My role here is since the development has happened, the, trust, the trustee has been inundated with calls about the property and she can't handle them. So she brought me on as agency to, to fill those calls and to, to talk to people that are interested in purchasing the property, moving her out or whatever the case may be and that's not happening right now. So I'm taking those calls and I'm fielding those calls and she invited me to this meeting because she's concerned about how the construction of this development is gonna s affect her daily life. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So uh, would the applicant like to address any of these uh, concerns just raised? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Jeremy Kraut again. Uh, it would be possible to bring up the aerial just to uh, show the adjacency so we can reference that. Uh, I think her concerns are, are well put. I mean, I, I'd be any... Um, neighboring property of mine, I'd want to make sure that they're considerate of and, and not going to affect my life, you know, if I, especially if I've been in a place for a number of years. Uh, so as you can see in the aerial, the outline of the, the parcel there, there is uh, a space between that par property and her and the, the home we're referencing. And then further, uh, if you go along Box Springs to the west, the access is shown there um, uh, quite a ways over. So the, uh, the project would not cause any impedance to access to the site. There was, uh, everything is planned on site. We're not requesting any off-site grading. Uh, we're not uh, planning for any severance of utilities that are being provided to that home. So uh, th that obviously would be a, um, not feasible and not something that we'd want to do. So um, certainly that concern is valid. And I know that uh, the city has uh, a number of ordinances uh, that related to noise control and and then the Air Quality Management District has a number of requirements from air pollution, and, and all of those have to be met and are, are uh, included in the conditions of approval and through any permit that has to be obtained for, for uh, construction. So um, all of those would be important uh, considerations. Hey, thank you. I, I guess what she's asking in there, and I, I would kind of expound on that, uh, with all things being equal and everything going well and fine and construction is fine, but then Plan B something happens what's plan b to take care of that resident uh, so there is a on-site uh, so a, a contractor general a contractor would be uh, a point of contact that would have um, on file with the city as well so if there was something that happened on site and there was a call um, usually goes first to the city uh, if something happens that, that's normal at least in experience with construction the city would have the contact information of the uh, the contractor and people on site to be able to say something happened here, fix this, and so that would be an immediate thing that would happen. Uh, that's what normally would happen. Or, or code enforcement, if they, if there was some issue that was happening, they, that would be would be involved as well. If it was an ongoing issue or something related to dust or water quality, there's um, you know if there's dirt spilling out into the street. But more specific to your concern, if there's something that's happening to utilities, I guess if that's maybe what you're referencing like a severance of a electrical line or something like that, then normally that they, they call uh, the electrical company, they, they call the city, or they go straight to the city, and then they, the city has contact information for the person on site. Um, but, you know, I think that's 
certainly if, if there is a desire that, of the, the neighbor to have the name and, and contact information of the contractor on site, I think we'd be certainly willing to do that to ensure that they, they have immediate access to that person on a regular basis to go one step further so they don't have to go through one step removed from just calling up the contractor saying, hey, you just turned off my power or something like that happened and we can that could be addressed right away. I guess I was thinking about something more immediate, maybe a generator ready to go, boom, hook it up to the bus, power comes right back on until the city gets out there right away. Water on site, we're ready to go, you know, just in case something does go, you know, anything, uh, transportation or whatever, I mean, just in case. You know, just something more immediate. And I'm not saying to develop that plan right now, but you know, it's a concern that's been risen, and 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 I guess because of her age and her condition, it sounds like the could have something ready to go. I mean, like right there, instead of waiting for the the city to come out and fix it, instead of waiting for water to be provided, instead of waiting for something to come out, to have something ready to go. It's just a thought. Well, it, typically from it, my past experience working in doing development stuff, that I mean. It is, there are accidents that happen and utilities get cut or, or water lines get uh, break and, and so forth. But, um, you know, typically if there is going to be a shutdown of electrical to do a tie-in or, or something like that, that there there is pre-notification. And I would assume that the, uh, I, and I assume is a loosely used word, but th that the general contractor, the, the, the engineer and the, and the uh, contractors would, be working with the appropriate utility companies to pre-plan those mm -hmm. and pr provide whatever the appropriate, uh, you know, at, at a minimum notification to that there's going to be a certain scheduled outage in, and then that, uh, you know, the, it would depend on the developer and the relationship they have or the owner of that property would be as a, as a general utility user be required to have to provide for that scheduled outage. Because typically there is rules that for allowing that to happen. Questions, Chair. Yeah. Since you heard the resident's um, concern and you have a general contractor that's going to be on site doing the project, just a recommendation because you only got to worry about one house. That's the beautiful part about it. Have your general contractor introduce himself to them and maybe exchange phone numbers. So what the commissioner mentioned, plan B will be ready to assist someone that wants to live out their dream in that house. You know what I'm saying? So that's important because they're going to go through changes with the construction and everything already. So. We just want to be development friendly to everybody. So just keep that in mind. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Are there any more comments? We have one more. Aurora Johnson. Hi. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, I'm actually my grandmother's trustee. Um, I've been in court, but that's not it. Um, the construction that is currently in production on the right-hand side of my grandmother's house, um, her electricity has been cut off since they've started constru construction anywhere from 10 to 15 times. It's from 10 in the evening until 8 in the morning. Um, she's, when I say she's incontinent, that means she doesn't have control of her bowels. When I say she's not ambulatory, that means she doesn't walk. Um, she does the, her caregiver is her son, her youngest son. He's 70. He has five children under the age of 13 that are living in the house with her. He also has, um, his wife who is helping take care of her. That's their job. They take care of my grandmother. Um, so my concern is when you have water and electricity cut off 15 to 20 times or more, during construction, that's an issue, especially if during that time she goes on herself because we have to shower her and clean her up. And all I want to know is how can we keep that from being consistently happening? 
Okay, I'm not against the construction. I'm not against anything. I just want to know, I want to make sure that somebody who's 96 and can't do anything for herself has access to water 24 hours and has access to electricity 24 hours. This um, past winter was long and cold. We were 20 to 15 degrees colder than normal and her heating was shut off. So that's what I'm concerned about. That's what I'm concerned about. That's the electric and the water. Thank you. Chair, if I might. Um, I'm assuming that uh, we have the residents' contact information on those green sheets. If we don't, um, I'll ask you when we finish here to please make sure that we have that. The issues that are being uh, brought to our attention are construction related, not use permit uh, related. So they're, they're an issue down the road. Uh, we want to make sure that this other, this one that's actively going on that we're, we're hearing about, the right people, it gets in the right people's hands so that we can address this if it's been cut off 10, 15 times. I certainly would want to know why. Um, but it's not something that this board uh, can handle or fix. What we're faced with is just the whether or not this use can be conditioned on this property. Um, so the residents' concerns are valid and we want to address them, but we want to make sure they get to the right people to address them. So is that something you'll look yes. look into? And so I just want to make sure that we have their contact information. Or whoever you have to um, it, it appears that we don't have their number, so if, if you wouldn't mind making sure we have those on those cards, uh, we'll follow up with you on that. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. Um, I any more comments? No, sir. Okay, at this time I will uh, close the uh, public hearing and uh, open it up for commissioner deliberations on the matter. I'll start, sir. I like the project. I like what the I like the project where it's going to be put at on Box Springs. Um it's going to do wonders in that neighborhood. I like the way the 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 bricks, the 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 paint, everything. Everything is going to look good. It reminds me of where my in-laws live in Florida where residents can rent but also have a, an opportunity to, to be assisted. So I hope when this project is done, it'll meet Joanne's standard of having a high-end place to live, because I think she deserves something like that in the future. You know, I know she's taking care of her mother, so I know about caretaking. You know, so it's important that you keep your promises. There's 136 conditions, and, um, like the city man, uh, city attorney mentioned, we're only here for one thing. But just remember, be development friendly. That's important for everybody around the neighborhood. And thank you for being here in Marino Valley. Anybody else like to deliberate or entertain a motion? I I think it's a, a wonderful uh, place and option for people like me to uh, be able to get pampered and. Uh, so I don't I, I like it and I know that that area there has been vacant for a long time and it's it's going to look really nice. So I don't have a problem with it at all. Yeah, I, I, I support the project as well. I think it's a I think it's good. I think uh, we're finally seeing some development along uh, that road. You can see the apartments are well underway to the to the west of this and uh, hopefully this re uh, re uh, invigorates the uh, Canyon Springs Plaza um, into uh, you know a more uh, robust uh, commercial center and I, I hope the applicant if this is approved I hope the applicant and the owner ownership over there and all the uh, consultants associated with the project and future contractors will address their neighbors um, that sounds like a very valid concern and it needs to be addressed and that's ridiculous if you've gotten impacted that severely by the other one and I think we heard from city attorney that they'll give them your address and that'll be a you know look into that so I, I can't guarantee what the outcome of it will be but um, I think you made your point very well to the applicant here if this is approved you should be getting a phone number you should be getting contact and so that's uh, it should uh, hopefully work out better than what you've seen other uh, comments? Anybody have a motion to uh, on this matter? 
I like no, I like the project, and I'd like to make a motion to move forward with it if we could. I'd like to move that we approve resolution 2019-25 and thereby certify that PEN 180205, a conditional use permit for transitional residential care housing, is exempt from provisions of the California Environmental Act, CEQA, and is a Class 32 categorical exemption and CEQA guidelines, Section 15332 for infill development projects and also approved conditional use permit PEN 18-0204 based on the findings contained in this resolution and subject to the attached conditions of approval, including Exhibit A. Um, that was a lot. I'll just say I'll second. <laughs> well done. <laughs> All right. We have a, uh, a uh, first by... Uh, uh, Commissioner Breaker and a second by uh, Commissioner Dijonet. Please uh, cast your vote. Ah, it's approved. We have a staff wrap up. Yes, the action taken by the Planning Commission is an appealable action. Any interested party would need to file the appeal. Uh, within 15 days of the action, directed in writing <coughs> to the community development director, stating specific reasons for the appeal, and along with the appropriate fee, if an appeal is received, it would be agendized for a hearing before the city council. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, the next item on the agenda is other commissioner commission business, and it doesn't look like we have any. So that's that. The next item is staff comments. Do we have any uh, comments? I do not. Good, and then moving right along. The next item is uh, commissioner comments. Do we have any uh, commissioner comments? Well, we are moving right along here. Oh, as, a, as the uh, new chairman, I declare that this meeting is adjourned <laughs> until the next, <laughs> until the next meeting on May 9th. <laughs> have a good night. <laughs> <laughs>